Eric Lang awakes long after the dawn to the distant sound of artillery. The gunmetal sky ripples with threatening black clouds and the dusty smell of rain hangs in the chill air. He is slumped back against the earthen wall, his left arm crooked and folded behind him. It comes awake in a flare of pinpricks and fire, and he winces as he works it free and shakes. His slender frame is wrapped in his thick woolen coat, sodden and heavy with mud, and he feels cold water seeping in through his threadbare trousers. Besides the upturned helmet lying in the mud a few yards away, he is alone in a narrow trench. He pulls his long legs towards his body and stands, feeling the cold air glide through the shifting folds of his clothes. The coat tugs at him as he stands, weighted down with filth. There is water in his boots, running down his legs as he stands to soak through the layered socks that protected the last bit of warmth and dryness. He scowls at the mud in the sky, and they are unmoved. He winces against the sudden pain in his head and chest as he tries to sort out the jumble of memories and awakening thoughts. He wonders idly what day it is, but he cannot recall the chaplain's last sermon. The only landmark he has to mark the progress of the days. He tries to remember the night before, or at least some small hint of how he'd ended here, soaking up rainwater in the trench. The preceding days are a monotone fog, a jumble of images and impressions of mud, soaked boredom and terror. Thought you might be dead, comes a voice from his left. He turns to see a figure. Leaning on the wooden post at the crook in the trench, his face is obscured by a gloved hand, gripping a smoldering cigarette. Eric blinks and strains to focus on the man, but his blood is now surging in anticipation of tobacco. He takes a few awkward steps, and he can see now. The crooked chin and bulbous nose of Carl Strauss. Aromatic smoke seeps from between his yellow teeth, and Eric wordlessly extends his hands. Carl drops the small leather pouch into them. When Eric has rolled, lit, and inhaled his first cigarette, he clears his throat and spits on the hard-packed earth. Why did you let me sleep out here? I could have froze, he rasps. His throat is raw and catches when he speaks. Carl chuckles, a deep rumble from his barrel chest, and flicks his cigarette against the wall. It collides noiselessly with a support beam and blossoms into a hundred momentary sparks. I let you do what you like, Lang. He grins at Eric and claps him sharply on the back. Eric momentarily considers anger, but cannot find the heart for it. The low tremor of a distant explosion ripples through the dirt and Eric stiffens. Big guns, far away, Carl says and Eric begins to relax. Us or them? Carl's eyes bulge slightly. For the thousandth time, Eric can see how perfectly Carl was suited to his life before the war. He pictures Carl on the stage, grease paint glinting in the lights, playing the clown, the fool, for the cream of Bavaria, a natural. Out here, in the blind spot of God, Carl is a natural of another sort. Eric has been with him in the beginning, since Belgium. Eric can recall the clown's visage, somehow pleasant and comical, Still, in the fire flight of Andine, as they burnt the village and fearing guerrilla fighters shot all the men. Carl and Eric walk the trench, taking the traverse back through the lines. A few men huddle for warmth in small groups, smoking or warming their hands on tin mugs of coffee. There is a lethargic stillness to the men, and they keep their eyes fixed on the ground or skyward, but avoid eye contact. Eric is grateful for the quiet passage. The first guard post is empty, and the mounted machine gun and mortar are unattended. Eric looks to Carl, but he seems unconcerned. Carl has kept a small rank of superiority to Eric for the past three years, and Eric has come to depend on relinquishing all judgment and worry to the older man. It has allowed him to live this long, unquestioning. Only the chaplain sits at the mess hall benches solemnly dipping a crumbling dry biscuit into his coffee. Carl and Eric join him, following his lead to soften the rocky bread. The chaplain, Sebastian Ross, 
looks at them with watery brown eyes through his scratched and chipped spectacles and nods almost imperceptibly before returning to the patient vivisection of his meal. Eric thinks to ask him what day it is, but can't imagine knowing would be worth the effort, and moves to lay his jacket on a small stove. Animic smoke drifts from it, and it seems no warmer than the surroundings. They sit in silence, draining the last of the coffee and rolling cigarettes from Carl's seemingly endless pouch. I just realized, starts Sebastian, his voice tenuous from disuse. I haven't seen an officer in at least a day. This is a good thing, most likely, Carl huffs with his crooked grin. What if, what if the, what if the line is breached and we're cut off with no one to tell us? The chaplain does not appear worried, merely curious. For a moment, Eric considers the logic in this conclusion and cold panic begins to coalesce him. Stick to the sermons, father, Carl snorts his derision. But the idea gnaws at Eric through the day. He passes scattered and listless men, all strangers to him, but no officers. It occurs that he cannot recall the last briefing they had. At an empty guidepost, he raises his head tentatively above the outside wall and gazes across the front toward the French line. As it has a thousand times before, the stark unearthliness of no man's land catches his breath and turns his heart to ice. Jagged cinders in the shape of trees, just defiantly from the craters and hillocks of carrion-soaked mud. Eric can see blue hands clutching at the sky, the ragged shreds of boys from across the empire. The land is dead. Eric knows this in some deep and primal way. He's seen burned farms and razed towns, but out here, it's different somehow. There's a palpable emptiness, a, a hollow that absorbs all sound and cuts away at those that persist in living here. Eric can feel it, reaching out to him from the monochrome charned fields. A shiver twists around his spine. I know it doesn't look like it, but he's here. Sebastian's voice is quiet and hollow. Eric turns to regard the chaplain briefly before returning his gaze back to the void. I admire your faith, Sebastian. Eric leaves the next part unsaid. Sebastian has been insisted and dedicated, but they've had this conversation many times. Eric knows they are going through the motions to satisfy Sebastian's guilt, but today he's too tired to humor him. Eric hasn't believed since Anden. Sebastian's smile is weary, and he looks grateful for Eric's non-participation. You'll see, he says at last. They stand in silence as a thin and fetid miasma of fog drifts over the dead land and spills like molasses into the trench. Eric is looking at the fog thicken and blot out the unburied dead. When he turns to see Sebastian is gone, the fog and the dead land stealing even the sound of his footsteps. The sky darkens and Eric gives up any hope of being dry or warm today. Uh, Concertina picks out a lively tune in the distance, but the fog muffles the sounds and robs the life from the notes. Eric tries to follow the wilting music, taking traverses and glancing down each line, but it always stays in the distance, circling around him in the enroaching gloom. At last, it dies away, mid-stanza with a mournful trill, and Eric is alone in the deepening gloom. He fights down panic as he backtracks towards the front line. The dark and the mist have muffled the world. The only sound is the scratching shuffle of his wet wool coat and the thread of his boots. The trench is empty and he is alone. Above him, the sky is a bruise, purple and darkening. He struggles to recall which direction the makeshift barracks are in, but this only makes him realize that he's not quite sure where he is at this moment. The fear has him now, a cold blue corpse's hand clutching at his lungs. He struggles to catch his breath and the filthy damp in his clothes presses inward, smothering his skin and extinguishing the heat like a flame. The world pitches a little, shudders, and he's suddenly aware of sitting. Carl above him and sliding a lit cigarette between his fingers. Eric catches a hold of his drumbeat heart and focuses on the warmth of the smoke. 
Carl is playing the father, his best paternal mask on his face. I worry about you, Eric, Carl says at last. What's going on? Eric demands. Carl smiles sadly and helps Eric to his feet. Does it matter? Carl offers at last, turning away. Get some sleep, boy. He hums tunelessly, and soon the fog swallows his music and the burning ember of his cigarette, and Eric is alone again. For the first time he can remember, Carl's assurance has not thawed the frost in him. His heart begins to surge again, terror winding around his ventricles and constricting. He loses his breath and begins to pant, dropping his helmet and running his fingers through his filthy hair. The sky seems to contract around him and the trench stretches away infinitely. Eric is gripped by fear and he slumps against the earthen barricade. There is a low thud, followed by an angry hissing and a bright column of red fire arcs into the sky, igniting the black fog. The world is suddenly bright and painted crimson. He stumbles to the edge of the trench and looks over the edge, hoping pitifully not to see what he knows is there. The nightmare landscape of filth and gore is cast into sharp and dancing relief by the burning flare, and the graveyard is picked out in sharp contrast. The dead trees loom menacingly, like prison bars around the dead. The fog hovers like a noxious living thing, its tendrils caressing the defiled earth. In the hellish stillness, he sees them, surging from the fog, hundreds, thousands of the enemy, breaking across the pitted ground like a wave. Bayonets on rifle barrels shudder across the surface like quills, and they are pressed together so close that Eric cannot pick one from the next. He grasps at his back for his rifle, and realizes with a sickening lurch that he doesn't have it. Hasn't had it all day. His sidearm holster is empty, the leather damp and torn. They are closer now, and the world is silent. Eric can see their hollow, empty eye sockets. He can see their hanging, shattered jaws and torn, leathery skin. He can see the French soldiers in ragged uniforms and the torn and burnt shapes of civilians. He can see his friends, his comrades. They all bear down on him beneath the warning flare light and utter an unbroken quiet. They crash over the edge of the trench and Eric feels a bayonet slide into his lungs. Hears their rifles fire and smells the burning wool and meat from his ragged wounds. He is crushed backwards, his arm folding beneath him as he tumbles to the floor. The rotting thing above him stands, panting. Eric looks up to it, but instead of warm, warm, choked cavities, he sees watery blue eyes and a filthy young face. He sees fear that matches his own. He sees a child. He sees. He begins to understand. The fog at last obscures his sight. Eric awakes, long after the dawn, to the distant sound of artillery. The gunmetal sky ripples with threatening black clouds. He is slumped back against the earthen wall, his arm crooked and folded behind him. It comes awake in a flare of pinpricks and fire, besides the upturned helmet, lying in the mud a few yards away. He is alone.